Hello, welcome to this online lecture intended for use with interpersonal communication. I am the instructor, Lee Pierce. You may email me with questions or comments at liampierce at gmail.com. And as always, please feel free to share. Today's topic is family communication. It is from the third edition of Reflect and Relate, chapter 10 in other uh, editions, it might be a different chapter. And we discuss family communication relatively early in the semester, even though it's chapter 10 in the book, because so much of how we construct our sense of self, our perceptions of others, and our intra and interpersonal communication habits and expectations stems from not only our communication behaviors in our family of origin, but also the behaviors in our current family situation, whether that's as a member of a nuclear family of origin, as a new blended family that you have established years later in life, or whether you are living with a group of roommates who have come to represent your family to you. As always, this chapter begins with a few items that you may want to familiarize yourself with. These are your on your own study items, and here they are. If you haven't done the on your own study items yet, I might suggest pausing this and heading to reflect and relate to look up some of these things through the index. I've also provided page numbers for those of you using the third edition of the book. Many of these will be referenced uh, throughout the lecture. You'll see us come back to communication privacy management and family privacy rules, for example. But for the purposes of background, these are things you can do on your own to keep the length of the lecture short. And whether you want to use a study guide that you create yourself or the online study guide that I have put together uh, that should be available through your e-learning management system as well as on the course Google Drive, that's up to you. But I do recommend that as you do the lectures, whether they're online or in class, that you take the time to have some kind of study guide um, inventory system so that when it comes time to study for exams, you already have some items in your inventory and you can review those and that you're putting your notes together as you study across the course of the semester so you're not having to go back at the end when the test is coming up and study and write notes on everything when you could have written them along the way. So that's just my advice, but do with that what you will. We begin discussing aspects of family communication with what's known as relational dialectics. These are not exclusive to families. Indeed, we talk about them in all of the realms of communication from the workplace to your own intrapersonal communication. But often dialectics are first encountered in family communication situations and the dialectical habits that we establish in our families carry over to later relationships. Therefore, relational dialectics tends to be brought up in most textbooks under the realm of family communication. But again, relational dialectics as a general concept is applicable throughout the course. So you will see us revisiting this material in later chapters. Vice versa, if it's chapter 10 in the book about family, we've already talked about relational dialectics in chapter two, especially when we talk about things such as extra and introversion. Uh, the, time, the way that your energy is used, that has a close relationship to your dialectical. Two specific uh, dialectics are important that we'll discuss today, autonomy and connection and openness and protection. But first, let's talk about what a relational dialectic is. A tension um, between ourselves and our feelings toward others. They can also be within ourselves, but today we'll just sort of talk about tensions within communication preferences with family. So again, they're impulses or tensions, and they're non-resolvable. So that's pretty important because a lot of people think that I'll be able to resolve these things, but tensions are kind of permanent. They remind us to keep our priorities straight, and they're important for that reason. So you're not trying to solve the dialectic. You're learning to sort of exist within the dialectic. The first one is autonomy and connection. Autonomy is the degree to which you like being alone, that you like to have a relationship with yourself, and connection is the degree to which you like to have a relationship with others. And some people will fall more toward the autonomy end of the spectrum. Some will fall more toward the connection end of the spectrum. But for all people, there will be a tension between these two factors to some degree. And learning to accept and manage it is an important part of developing strong communication habits. For people that tend to fall more toward the autonomy end, they prefer more autonomous communication than they do connected communication. 
Task sharing can be an awesome way to share tasks with family members, and those tasks allow in the same plane as other people, so to speak, without having necessarily to sacrifice your autonomy. So some people like a family TV night or a family movie night where the movie goes on, everyone sort of agrees on the movie, we are all watching the movie together, we feel connected, but if I have a higher preference for autonomy, I might be typing on my laptop or coloring or whatever, knitting while everyone else is chatting do th through the movie. Social networks are more for connected people um, to Typically, they're, they're perceived as something that connected people use to relate, but they can actually work in both ends. So if you're an autonomous person who tends to not have a good sense of keeping connection with others, social networks can be valuable for this reason. They can also be time-sucking. So I find that as a person who is more on the autonomy end of the spectrum, I very much dislike Facebook. It sucks a lot of my energy out, and I feel as if it is a drain on my energy, and that makes me less likely to connect with people. So I tend to use platforms like LinkedIn, which are, there's, there's restraints, right? There are rules around what can be done on LinkedIn. There's certain types of social norms that prevent the kinds of posts that Facebook might encourage. And as a result, I can still have a connected network, but the amount of energy I have to put into maintaining it is minimal. And I respect the fact that LinkedIn imposes certain kinds of norms to prevent the communication from getting out of control. On the other hand, if you are a person who sort of thinks of yourself as on the connected end of the spectrum, social networks can be very valuable for you because they've, uh, studies have shown that people who exist at the center of their social network hubs actually have stronger senses of self and health and wellness outcomes. But it can be time consuming. Uh, that's true if you're a caregiver for people in your family, if you're spending a lot of time on social media, any time where your primary source of self satisfaction is through your connectedness that can be dangerous because you do not develop the kinds of autonomy that are necessary for people especially as they get older and social networks start to decline to have positive health and wellness outcomes so if you spend um, more I would say than an hour roughly per day currently on social networking whether it's maintaining your social network updating your profile commenting on other people's posts sharing links etc you're spending too much time on social networks that's also true if you're spending more than one hour a day on social networks, such as being on the telephone, that's too much time. So you might want to start by taking 15 minutes, finding a place you can find 15 minutes so that you can scale back and then devoting that 15 minutes to an autonomous activity, such as journaling or reading a good book or watching a television show that you like by yourself or knitting or anything where you're spending time with yourself, learning to develop a relationship with yourself. Openness and protection is another dialectic. Openness is how much you like to share. We've talked about this with self-disclosure. Typically, uh, openness is about low risk perception, so you have high preferences for self-disclosure. Protection is more about low preferences for self-disclosure because you have a high sense of risk. The ways to manage this, uh, privacy rules, family communication boundary management is very important. That's something that I asked you to review on your own. It gives you some strategies and some guidelines for how to manage com uh, family communication privacy. We'll also discuss triangulation. Triangulation is a very niche topic within this subset of dialectic, but I think it's an important one that we often miss. And so we'll talk about that on a later slide. For now though, you should know what a dialectic is. You should understand the two primary dialectics especially in family communication, which is autonomy and connection and openness and protection. You should understand what those mean and you should understand uh, the and know a few strategies for managing those, which I discussed over the last few minutes. Family communication dimensions, much like the four column charts that we frequently see in class, are going to fall along two axes, conversation orientation and conformity orientation. An orientation just means a way of relating to something. So you orient yourself in the world. You feel disoriented. Conversation orientation is the degree to which you are engaged in participation and breadth of conversation, meaning does your family have a lot of conversation about a lot of topics? That would be breadth. Is there high involvement in all of the different areas? That would be participation. For example, you could have a family member who talks a lot about many, many different things, but is sort of talking to themselves and knows no one's listening. That would not necessarily count as high participation, although it might count as high breadth, depending on how much that family member 
had an influence on the people around them. You can have high and you can have low in the axis, but of course people fall all along different ranges and it can depend uh, on different members of the family because some families have certain members with high conversation orientation and certain members with low conversation orientation. So when you're thinking about your own family communication style, I tend to look at the overall pattern and typically, especially if you are a child of a parent and you have one parent with high conversation orientation but another parent with low conversation orientation, you will absorb the orientation of the parent who is most vocal about their preferences. So if you have a very chatty parent who loves to chat and they're always insisting on chatting and they make everyone else chat, then your family technically has high conversation orientation, even if there is a parent who is not conversational very often, but they don't insist that other people sort of follow their lead. Then there's conformity orientation, and this is the diversity or similarity in attitudes and beliefs. High conformity means that the family insists on a lot of similarity of beliefs, and they can do that either by having everyone agree on all topics, or they can prevent people from discussing topics that are going to produce discord. So in other words, you might have high participation and conformity on one topic, but you might have limited breadth to prevent other topics, such for example as politics, for creating problems. And then you can have low conformity, which simply means that people are able to freely have opinions as they choose. This can change over time, obviously, because as people get older, they often have more tolerance for higher sets of diversity and attitudes, whereas when people are younger, um, there's younger children in the family, that can be problematic. Once we understand the two axes of family conversation and conformity orientation, we can identify four types of families. Now the book is going to sort of paint the pluralistic family as the ideal and the laissez family as kind of problematic. I don't agree with that. I think, first of all, that not every family is one of the four types. I think you can have hybrid types. I think you can have different types within the same family. So for example, uh, siblings might be laissez-faire, whereas the sibling-parent relationship might be protective, or certain family members might be protective, but relationships with other family members might be consensual. So there's a lot of ways to slice this pie up. Also, I think that there's blends. So most families, much like when we discussed um, your attachment style, most families fall along sort of uh, the border. So you might have a laissez-faire slash protective style, or you might have a protective slash consensual style. So there's lots of different ways to put this together. So we'll just talk about the four types, and then when you do your own self-assessment of your family, you can kind of decide whether you're maybe a blend, or maybe there's a dominant pattern in your family, but there's also a sub-pattern in your family for a certain group of community members. So essentially, if you have low conversation, low conformity, you have a laissez-faire family. That's a word you may have heard related to economics, and it means uh, hands off. It actually means, I think in French, let the hands do what they will do, but Essentially, it's a hands-off model of uh, family orientation. And you can understand why that'd be an issue because obviously when you have little children especially, you need rules, you need uh, bedtimes, and you need schedules, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but not always. My family was very laissez-faire when I was a child, and I think it had a lot of benefits. It also had some drawbacks, including that I never sort of learned to appreciate regulation and discipline. I uh, reacted negatively against it. So always trade-offs. Always in this class are trade-offs. There's no ideal type of family. There are just trade-offs um, between different types of families, and you kind of have to decide which trade-offs you are willing to live with. So the laissez-faire, it says few emotional bonds in the book. I don't know if I agree with that, especially since we are studying communication, not psychology. I have no idea in a laissez-faire situation if the family has low emotional bonds or if they all are just really comfortable doing their own thing, knowing that everyone is there for them if they need them. So they might actually have excellent emotional bonds, and that allows them to go off and do their own thing. So I don't know that I can speculate on the emotional situation, but I can speculate on what the communication looks like. And the communication looks like more independent thinking, uh, less conversation, less conformity expectations. People form their own opinions, and certainly there's discussion. But maybe discussion doesn't need to be as uh, participatory or as broad. Then you also have a situation in which you have low conversation orientation. So there's not as much talking happening, quantity, but you have a higher sense of conformity. 
So you're still not talking much, but when you do talk, there's sort of the expectation that everyone will fall in line. This is a protective family. So you'll see that it's important in those families that communication styles emphasize obedience and family norms. There's going to be a high power differential, so the communication will reflect a sense of hierarchy. And there'll be lower rates of disclosure. So again, more surface level disclosure, or if there is deep disclosure, it happens much more rarely. Now, on the opposite end of laissez-faire, you have a consensual. A consensual shares with protective a high sense of conformity, but has a much higher conversation orientation than protective. And this is a situation where you have lots of disclosure, lots of attentiveness, lots of chatting. However, conflict tends to be threatening, and there's a, a prioritization of unity and parental authority. So I often notice that this happens in... Uh, uh, Bible study groups tends to be a place where I see this happen a lot, even though that's not officially a family in the sense there are no blood ties. There's a, there's a consensual kind of norm of communication, right? There's a lot of discussion. There's a lot of disclosure. There's a lot of attentiveness to people. People like to share. But there's sort of a sense that the goal is for everyone to take away the same meaning as opposed to everyone coming to discuss their own indi individual interpretations. That's also true of group therapy programs such as Al-Anon, where there is a lot of attentiveness, there's a lot of emphasis on disclosure, but there's protocol, there's routine, so that the group unity is emphasized and conflict or crosstalk is discouraged. So those are other realms where you can see consensual activity sort of being very important. Then we finally have pluralistic, and pluralistic families have both high conversation orientation and high uh, and low conformity. So they are lots of debating, lots of judging. Um, there's a low power differential, so you see people who are, for example, children or spouses asserting the same level of authority or right to an opinion as the traditional patriarch or matriarch of the family and they tend to deal directly with conflict. Now, directly doesn't necessarily mean proactively. So that doesn't mean that the conflict is productive or happy or leads to positive outcomes. It just means that people are not afraid to say when they are unhappy, or if they are afraid, they still do it anyway. But they can also be highly reactive, a lot of sort of blowing up at the dinner table and then things calming down later and then blowing up. So don't necessarily think that pluralistic means awesome because certainly there are pluralistic families that have a lot of discord and a lot of um, negative conflict management.